This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. We are talking sociopath, psychopath, personality disorder, whatever you want to call it. And I don't like to jump down the label hole because it kind of... I don't know. At the end of the day, does it really matter what one is labeled? Is it more so about what one actually did? But sometimes it does provide some context as to how the individual got to where they're at today that we have to figure out as we peel back the layers of the onion on. We are talking with Donna Anderson today, author and a sociopath profiler about Brian Koberger. And I'm just going to start here and let you kind of take where you want to go uh, what, with everything that we know about Koberger, what thus far has been your take? Well, what's really interesting about this case is that I did a couple of articles related to him on the Love Fraud blog. And what I did was I compared what's known about his behavior and his actions with an instrument called the Psychopathy Checklist Revised. And that is an assessment that was developed by Dr. Robert Hare, who is like the the guru of psychopathy researchers. And the instrument was designed specifically to figure out whether or not people who were incarcerated would reoffend once they were released. So it definitely has a criminal aspect to it. And that, that was the objective, to find out who upon release would commit crimes again and who wouldn't. And this uh, PCLR has been validated by hundreds of studies to, as it's considered to be the gold standard of evaluating whether or not somebody is actually a psychopath. Mm-hmm. And so I compared what is known about Koberger's behavior to the items, because there's a list of uh, 20 different behaviors. And um, depending on how many of them, how many boxes somebody checks, uh, that is uh, the higher the score, the more likely they are to be considered um, psychopathic. And believe it or not, he didn't score very high on that document, on, on that test. And I I was a little shocked by that because intuitively one would look at this behavior, of course, assuming that he's guilty, which we Mm -hmm. don't know yet. um, But one would look at the behavior if he were guilty and you'd you'd think that, my goodness, this guy must be a raging psychopath. Let me ask ask right there. What kind of questions are asked uh, where he didn't score that as high as you thought he would? What were some of the parameters there? Okay, well, um, there are. Uh, 20 different items on this uh, list. And the way it works is that somebody can be scored either a zero, meaning they don't show that behavior at all, a one, meaning they show it sometimes or somewhat, or a two, meaning that they, you know, this this totally um, describes uh, their behavior. So there's there's two main segments to it. One is about the antisocial behavior. So those items were a need for stimulation and proneness to boredom and a parasitic lifestyle and poor behavior controls and sexual promiscuity and a lack of realistic long-term goals, uh, impulsivity, irresponsibility, early behavior problems, juvenile delinquents, and parole or probation violations. So those are all related to antisocial behavior. Then it has um, emotional in- and interpersonal traits, which includes glibness and superficial charm, a grandiose sense of self-worth, um, pathological lying, conning and manipulativeness, a lack of remorse or guilt, shallow affect, and that means um, shallow emotions, um, callousness and lack of empathy, and failure to accept responsibility for their actions. And then there were two other factors. Uh, One of them is committing a wide variety of crimes and having many short-term marital relationships. So those are the 20 different things that are measured. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at it, he only ticked four of them. (laughs) How, (laughs) how, How difficult is it to fill that out, though, with the information that we do know about him? Or do we have enough or is there enough out there to accurately check or not check those boxes? We don't know. 
I mean, right now, you know, all, all all any of us know is what's in the media. Sure. And, um, you know, in order to do this, I, the way because I was actually trained in how to do these evaluations and what you're supposed to do is um, gather up all the uh, what's called the file, you know, any records of somebody's behavior and then also do an interview with the person and then perhaps also do interviews with other people who who like maybe the friends, maybe the family, uh, other people to get a, a larger picture of what's going on. So um, it, it, I, I mean, I was shocked to go at this because the only ones that uh, are apparent right now in from the media reports mm-hmm. are are these four like yeah. need stimulation and proneness to boredom. I mean, you know, if he sure. did something like this, I guess he needs stimulation. Um, grandiose sense of self worth. I mean, he definitely wanted people to know how intelligent he was. Mm-hmm. Um, shallow affect because, you know, multiple former classmates and other people commented about how he was uh, expressionless and had flat emotions and then callous and lack of empathy. Well, if if he actually did this, then you'd have to be callous and have no empathy in sure. order to carry something out, uh, you know, like this crime. So um, and then uh, I, also, you um, I, I I did that comparison early on, you know, before they released the information, like from the police report. And um, so if it were that he actually did these things, uh, there's the possibility that we would see a lack of remorse or guilt. But so far, he hasn't said anything about the crimes. So we, we don't know what that would be. But the other thing is that even though he's not coming up high on this particular measure, there are other ways to measure psychopathy. Uh, there's there's at least two other programs that are considered to be um, alternative ways of uh, diagnosing someone. And this might be one of those cases where the instrument doesn't work, mm-hmm. you know, where where one of the other measures is needed. What are those other measures? Well, there's one that's called the psychopath, the psychopathic personality inventory, mm-hmm. and that one is actually a self-report test, and it has 154 items uh, divided into eight categories, and it measures things like uh, Machiavellianism and social potency, which means you know how much charm and interpersonal dominance somebody has. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also a section on cold-heartedness. And and then carefree non-planfulness. And what that means is that lots of uh, people who are psychopaths uh, essentially have no plan for their life. And, you know, they just, you know, do whatever they feel like it. Um, fearlessness is another uh, thing. And then um, blame externalization, which means that they blame everybody else for what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, impulsive uh, and immunity to stress. So, you know, um, maybe he would score higher on this particular test, but it's 154 items. And I actually don't know what all those items are, but that's a possibility because you're talking about uh, cold heartedness and fearlessness sure. and blame externalization. So maybe that's a better fit. Sure. So I mean, to find all that out, I mean, we you have to, you have to sit down with someone to truly make a, a, an accurate diagnosis uh, of an individual but from afar, are there ways to accurately diagnose someone without being there and, and actually having a, a, a one-on-one conversation or relationship with someone? Well, actually, the PCLR, the first one that I talked about, is designed for that. Okay. I mean, it is actually designed to that somebody could uh, look at the record and uh, evaluate what the person did based on the record and based on information from others without actually talking to the individual themselves. And so that's why it, it's kind of odd that that particular one is, is coming up short so far, I mean, yes. you know, and, and, you know, we'll just have to see exactly what happens, but you know, like some of the items on that list. Um, I mean, a lot of people certainly didn't seem to think that he was charming, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and uh, there, there was no, well, I guess there was a record of early behavior problems if you count the um, the heroin addiction when he was in high school. Um, irresponsibility. It doesn't sound like he's irresponsible. You know, he's he's uh, working as a teaching assistant, as a graduate assistant. Mm-hmm. Uh, sexual promiscuity. That doesn't seem to fit. 
you know, lack of long, real, realistic long-term goals. Well, he's trying to be a criminal profiler, so that seems to be a goal. So overall, you know, it just didn't work, which was surprising. Sure. So we, we don't necessarily know uh, what all the boxes would be checked for him as of right now. Uh, so it's hard to, to truly put a label on someone. Does someone like this always get a label? Is there always, you know, we, we're so quick to say, oh, it's a sociopath, it's a, it's a psychopath, it's a this, it's a that. Um, is, are there, is there going to be some sort of diagnosis for a human being like this? Is there always a diagnosis for someone who does something like this? Well, one of the things about diagnosing anybody is that people are not um, cookie cutter, yeah. you know, and, and if, if you look at some diagnosis for people, uh, like a, a, a therapist may say that, you know, somebody is uh, antisocial with narcissistic tendencies, you know, or, yeah. or something along those lines, uh, because people are different. And, uh, you know, so, and this may be one of those cases where, you know, he doesn't, fit the the mold of a mass murderer even though if if he becomes uh convicted and and yeah you know, i mean there's an awful lot of evidence that points in that direction I mean, of course we haven't had the trial yet so innocent until proven guilty but you know what was in that police report is like oh my goodness i mean they they it looks like they have some serious evidence about what happened so i mean people are different and sometimes you know the the labels don't necessarily totally apply uh, with when you look at this this whole case and in him what what do you see what based on your experience not just the the test and things of that nature what what do you think we're going to learn about this individual that we have not learned yet well assuming that um you know once the court hearing is held and he actually did these things um and, and as i said the evidence mm -hmm. looks pretty strong at this time one would have to have no conscience and no ability to love um, in, in order to do something like this. So um, I, it, it may turn out that he does fit these other definitions of psychopathy. Now, um, I, I mentioned one of the alternate. Another one is called the triarchic metal model of psychopathy. And this has three different um, categories of traits. Um, there's disinhibition, which includes impulsiveness and weak behavioral restraint, hostility and mistrust, and difficulties in regulation emotions. So that's one. The other is meanness, which is deficient empathy, lack of affiliative, uh, contempt, predatory exploitativeness, and empowerment through cruelty. Well, that sounds just like him, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And then boldness, which is dominance and social assurance and venturesomeness, and then emotional resiliency. So maybe. With this particular model, it would come up that he does fit um, psychopathy. How, if in any way, will this play a role in a trial? Should it go there? My guess is that would depend on whether or not either the prosecution or the defense wants to bring it up. Um, you know, because there's a lot of debate on how a diagnosis should be used in a, a trial. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Robert Hare, who I mentioned previously, his view is that people who are psychopathic know what they're doing, okay? They're not delusional, and they um, they made the choice to do whatever behavior that they've done, and so therefore they should suffer the consequences of that choice, However, there are other cases in which people have actually um, like avoided the death penalty because they were uh, proven to be psychopathic. And it was something that happened since birth. And, you know, there I mean, people have actually gone into trial. I mean, defense uh, psychologists have gone into trial with showing their brain scans and showing how their scan is uh, not normal, that, mm -hmm. you know, parts of the brain that light up in normal people just don't even function um, in, in, in a psychopath. And so there's at least a couple of cases where people have I don't know if they've been found um, innocent, but they have gotten lesser sentences because they were considered to have deficiencies due to the psychopathy. Is this something that could be brought up in the defense in the upcoming hearing in June with Koberger? Because uh, who knows what they're actually going to bring up because the evidence is pretty damning against him. Uh, my, my wonder is if they're going to make some sort of a plea 
of look, look at this man's history, maybe brain scans, maybe other things to show that this individual, yeah, functioning in society, but missing something and obviously not able to successfully, healthily function in society, more so in the lines of, yeah, you can put him away for life, but let's not kill him because in the end, this person didn't have the, uh, the whatever it was to tell him not to do this. I think it'd be a far stretch uh, probably at this point, but I, I don't really know what angles they're going to take. All we heard from the Koberger camp as far as I look forward to being exonerated. Right. So I don't know what the defense strategy will be. Um, if, if they think that it will gain them something, um, maybe maybe they will. But there's also the possibility that if he were diagnosed as a psychopath, uh, some some um, courts consider that to be an aggravating factor that it actually, you know, proves that he actually did this and he has no conscience and he, and he should be locked up in the key thrown away. So I, I don't know what their strategy will be, but um, it, it may or may not come up at all. That's what I wonder. I mean, when someone exhibits these traits uh, and it doesn't come up at all, is that something that, that an evaluation could be done or could be ordered even by the prosecution to, to fur further prove that maybe he does have something like that? Would that help their case? I think that what would happen is the prosecutors would um, determine whether or not it's in their benefit, uh, you know, to try and prove that the, the mm -hmm. case, it, it, it may not be. I mean, it, sure. it, from the prosecution point of view, if they open up that can of worms sure. that, you know, this person has mental problems or it has a personality disorder, well, then that gives the defense an opportunity, you know, to argue their side of the case. Sure. So there's a possibility they, they wouldn't bring it up at all. So, uh, my yeah. guess is if anyone was going to bring it up, it might be the defense. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think that uh, we'll be able to know that. We'll just have to see what happens. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. Press subscribe wherever you download podcasts. You don't miss any of our breaking updates and discussions on the cases we're following here for you. You can get the complete list of the cases in the episode description. If you want an ad-free experience, well, check that out on Apple Podcasts. We do appreciate that. Your support keeps us on the air. My name is Tony Bruski. Stay with us.